Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Little. I am the sex and politics editor at Playboy magazine. I came here from Ms. Magazine, where I spent several years covering gender, so it means a lot for me to be here in this space at Playboy's first pop-up event, introducing two women who require no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, when we were envisioning this idea of bringing the pages of the magazine to life, um, Roxanne Gay was the first name that came to mind. She's the most important and most accessible feminist commentator of our time. Uh, she's the author of several critically acclaimed books, my favorite of which are Hunger and Bad Feminist. <laughs> and she is just simply hashtag goals for a lot of millennial women like myself. And with someone like Roxanne Gay, we really wanted to put her in conversation with someone who stands for similar values. So we were so glad when she invited comedian Kathy Griffith. <laughs> who was also um, featured as a Playboy interview last year to sit down with her for a wide ranging discussion on the meaning of intersectional feminism in the digital age. Playboy feels super honored to have both of these powerhouses with us in this space. And we're glad to continue our legacy of providing a platform for important ideas. So thanks. Enjoy, everyone. Roxanne Gay, give it up. Roxanne Gay. And Kathy Griffin, everyone. What? All right. I stood for myself. I stood for myself. Sometimes I mean, you give yourself you a standing ovation. I, I would. I all right. All the What's time, the meaning morning? of the word feminist? Oh. I'm kidding. I said, <laughs> I said it before I go, is there just one question you find annoying? And so I had to just start with that. I thought that was smart. <laughs> just get it out of the way. Like, fucking feminism. <laughs> all right. So we have so much to discuss. We do. I, I, I have a question for you that I, 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 I'm so curious to hear your answer. Mm -hmm. What do you love the most about your blackness? Oh. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I wasn't ready. I know. I, I was like, I got to have a, like a bomb for the first one. Oh, man. You know, first of all, I love the skin tone. But, <laughs> you know, I think for me, the thing I love most is that I have a unique point of view. And I think every black woman does. Every person does, but every black woman has a specific and very interesting point of view. And I love that we're finally living in a time where people are more open to understanding and listening and learning from that point of mm -hmm. view. Uh, and I'm Haitian American. And my parents always raised us to understand as Haitians that our ancestors were free. And I love that about my blackness, that for me, freedom from colonization was a possibility. And I think that sense of possibility has encouraged a lot of my ambition. So do you, do you not like the term African American for you? Oh, no, I do. I, I go by both. Okay. Um, I'm not picky about it because I do too. I'm black. <laughs> of course you do. Just once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no problem. I go by black, African American, Haitian American. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're all appropriate and they all fit. All right. So I think uh, I read that you grew up from, from birth in Omaha. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. And how many black people are there? Uh, about 10. Okay. Okay. That's good. More than, you know what? There are more black people in Nebraska than you would think. Gabrielle Union is another Omaha native. Good. And so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you went back and forth to Omaha yes, because of... My dad's it? job. And what was that? He's an engineer. He builds tunnels. Oh, so cool. he built the Eisenhower tunnels. He oh, my built, God. Um, the yellow line in D.C. He built a, a subway line in New York. And so we would go to wherever a tunnel needed to be built, mm -hmm. and he would build it. And then we would go back to Omaha, uh, where all the Haitians are. But there were five, <laughs> there were five Haitian families growing up. And there is, I don't know, it's like maybe 3% black in Omaha, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, which is a lot for Omaha. It seems like you have grown up a lot of times around white people, white culture, white neighborhoods. Did uh -huh. you have that feeling of like, oh gosh, I'm your one black friend, or I'm the oh, one black sure. person in this event yet again? I'm always the one black person. The great thing about being where I am in my career today is that I can insist that I'm not the only black person. Give me an example. So Besides calling Gabriel Union 24 hours a day, saying, get over here, honey. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, whenever I'm asked to be on a panel, I don't want to be the only black person, because mm -hmm. blackness contains multitudes. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, 
white culture loves to elevate one black person as the spokesperson. And think they're done. Correct. Okay, like, oh, we're, we're done. done. We've covered we're our good. bases. And she's queer. Like, oh, oh okay. let's just woo, all go home. Box is checked. And I, first of all, if I'm the only black person in your Rolodex, you are really bad at your job. Mm -hmm. And then I have to do your job for you, which shame on you. And so I do also include the shaming. Uh, because it's essential. I, it is essential. It feels so good. It yeah. feels so fucking good. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just try to make sure I'm not the only one. And if I'm the first, I make sure that I'm not the last. Nice. So if you leave an event where you were the only black person, you go, okay, next time. Correct. I'm here are five black, black women Got you it. should be calling to do this event. Or here are five black women who should be writing for you. And then I call those black women and tell them what they offered me for pay. Yeah, good. That's huge. Yeah. That's actually something you and I share in common because I, um, uh, cer certainly since the Trump photo a couple of years ago, one of the things that I go out of my way to talk about is how much money I have or how much I've made. Mm -hmm. And I think of all the years, you know, I'm 58, so I'm from a generation where you weren't supposed to say that stuff. And when you're a female, you just were an asshole if you talked about it. Yep. And I thought after that, I thought, yeah, it's I, we have to get women talking about money. And obviously, that's how dudes don't pay us equally is they know that when we're all in the cubicles, mm -hmm. the guys are making more, but no one's going to be honest about what they're making and stuff. Absolutely. So I, I agree. I think women should really uh, feel good about talking to each other and, and about the finer points, like as much detail as possible. I agree. Helping each other about, you know, how to get a raise. And also sometimes I, I'm glad you brought up shaming because I honestly think in this uh, what we're going through, this political atmosphere, sometimes shaming is the only thing that works. Yeah. And I, I'll go to any march, mm -hmm. but I gotta say, sometimes when you can really sort of bust someone in a, uh, a way where there's a paper trail or something and, and shame them in a way that it is just so obvious, sometimes that's the only thing that moves the dial. It really is, and especially when it comes to money, I find that shaming works. In what way? when you highlight an injustice financially, then all of a sudden they have to scramble and say, oh no, we didn't mean it that way. Well, yeah. Yes, you meant it that way because that's what you paid me for four years. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bitter, but. Oh, uh, <laughs> love it, love bitterness. It's, it's, it's underrated, so important. And it's I underrated. Think not only do we have to be open about money, we have to be open about the fringe benefits like car service or mm -hmm. travel accommodation. Things that do make you safer. Yes, and more comfortable. Yes, and, and would fall under white privilege, I would say. Yes, absolutely. And so it's just important, and I try to do it as often as possible. The downside, of course, is that when you talk about money, people punish you for it. Oh, yeah. They love to say all kinds of, talk all kinds of shit like about how out of touch you are and this and that, and it's like, okay, sh sure. But when you don't <laughs> talk about money, they say, why aren't you giving numbers? It's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I'm always going to err on the side of talking openly about money. I agree. And I think it's important for everyone. First of all, I think everyone should be proud of whatever financial st like level they are. You know what I mean? It, it, for me, I, I try to be, I, I, I like to live debt free because I'm paranoid and I've been a out of work actress so many times. But I think that's another thing women can kind of help mm -hmm. each other out and be honest about. I fell into this financial pitfall. Don't don't do this, you know. So I, I miss the Oprah show. I tell you, like I, the more yeah. I think, like there's there's really no one who kind of covers like those issues the way she used to do. Like when she used to have Susie Orman on, it would be like week after week and stuff like that. But anyway, um, okay. My other question. This one. This is the one I struggle with. Um, I I am a self-proclaimed uh, feminist. Mm -hmm. You of course can define that however you want. But I feel like the dirty secret of feminism is that women have been tougher on me in my personal life and career than men. And I I just want, I have to say it out loud. And I, okay, thank you. Because, no, I, I, I don't mean to put down other women at all, but what I find shocking, and I wanted to ask you why you think this is, mm -hmm. I think it's so easy to support other women. It's yep. so easy for me to, at least go online and support other female comedians, and especially someone who's going through a Michelle Wolf situation or a Samantha Bee situation or you know whatever. But um, it, I, I'm wondering why you think so many women seem to stop at that, mm -hmm. and then when it can sometimes get to the point where women will click up actually against another woman. Yes. So 
I get asked this a lot and I think about this a lot because I don't think it's unique to women. I think it's human nature to be terrible. And <laughs> when women do it, it's because they're working from a place of scarcity and the scarcity mentality that there can be only one. And right. honestly, to be fair, there's a lot about capitalism that suggests there can be only one there if you're a not a history. heterosexual white man. Yeah. So I think a lot of times women are as subjected to the patriarchy as anyone else, and some of us can rise above it, and some of us can't. Um, but I don't think it's this thing where we say, oh, look, women are just as bad too. No, women are just as affected by misogyny mm -hmm. and this idea that we are in a competition with one another. And it's really frustrating because I too agree it's very easy to support other women because that woman doesn't have my job. Mm -hmm. She's not taking my gig. Uh, I'm a very acquired taste, so either you want me or you don't. You no, know? but I, I, I feel the same way. I really feel there's room for everyone, and I understand that, certainly in stand-up comedy, there, there really were decades and decades where there was one person. It was just Moms Mabley, or it was just Phyllis Diller, or it was just Joan Rivers. And I'm 58, and so I remember those days mm -hmm. where I, even I thought, like, oh, I guess there's only going to be one famous female comedian. But um, I got over it, and I'm, I'm sort of, I, I, I don't know, I'm going to be honest. I, I get disappointed sometimes in the younger women yeah. that still sort of play into that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do you think that they maybe still feel sort of like colonized maybe from their parents, or they sort of dipped into the I'm going to support other women and then maybe got like an online pushback or what? I think it's a combination of all of those things. And it is, I, I'm always disappointed when I see women doing that, where they act so predatory against other women. Mm -hmm. It's just not necessary. We don't need to be this way. And I just think, come on, fucking be better. Yeah. Um, like, we can be better than this. And frankly, they will have, they being men, will have so much to worry about if we would just get on the same page. Mm -hmm. And especially since the 2016 election, when 53% of white women voted for Trump, I just keep thinking, if y'all would get it together and stop thinking that if you were adjacent to power, that would be the same as having power, um, yeah. we would accomplish so much more. Yeah. Um, it's really painful. And, I, I, and when you call them out on it, they get very defensive Yes. and say, I'm making a choice. And I'm like, yeah, you are actually making a choice. But that choice is informed by a lot of factors that you are not acknowledging. Uh, I agree. Right. I think there's a lot of denial. I, I always get a beat down when I, when I say half in jest. I've had it with white bitches. Mm. But honestly, for me to, like I said, my, I'm 58. I've, I've, I absolutely thought we'd have a female president by now. And I'm sorry, I don't mean Elizabeth Dole and Sarah Palin. I mean like a qualified, like, you know, like Hillary Clinton, like a qualified woman. And when I heard that stat, it blew me away. Mm. And even, as you know, I have these fears and feelings of like, gosh, do, really, do women really support each other? Yeah. And that stat is shameful. And that's why I say sometimes it's okay to shame. And I will go up to uh, white bitches and just say, what were you thinking? And when they say things like, well, I wanted something different. And I'm just like, you know, go deeper. And they kind of can't. No, they can't. They and, have nothing to say about it. But how, how do you explain women that, you know, went to... Uh, have higher education degrees and know better, like, do you think it's that they, you know, I don't know. I, when, I asked Steinem about this one time, and she said, women can be colonized anywhere. You oh, can absolutely. have a wealthy white suburban woman who went to Yale, mm -hmm. maybe became a stay-at-home mom, nothing wrong with that, but over the years didn't realize she was becoming colonized, and next thing you know, she's voting for Trump, and you're right, being very defensive with us about like, who are you to tell me to vote for? And I wanted something different, and my favorite is, there's just something about Hillary I didn't like. I can't put my finger on it. Hmm. Is it the what vagina? Could it be? I would say it would be the vagina. <laughs> so how, how do we explain, and I know we shouldn't um, deal with polls, and I don't, I'm not speaking to Nate Silver, I don't, also don't know him, but um, how do you explain, like I'm really struggling with the fact that all those white guys are ahead of Everybody, yeah. every woman, every woman of color, mm -hmm. even Booker and Castro. Which so is saying something. It's deep. Like it's Misogyny is really deep. And I would, uh, before Obama was elected, I would have thought it would be easier for a woman to become president. Yes. And I was so wrong about that. I was too. I genuinely thought Hillary was going to win. We all did. And to see what happened... And to see that people were more comfortable with the idiot in president, like the idiot in the White House right now, like than 
with Hillary Clinton, who is flawed, but my God, she can at least read. Um, but right, but also, also, it, it is a generational generational issue. Like I remember the beatdown when she tried to participate in health care yeah. when her husband was, you know, president, and that was. I thought it was appalling when it happened, and I really thought we had moved beyond that. And, yep. you know, I thought, well, what's wrong with the First Lady doing something, you know? Yeah. That, it's amazing to me that even all those years later... Uh, Nothing has changed at all, and yeah. the conversations are How so uncomfortable. It? You know, I think that shaming is going to go a long way. I really do. I think that calling these women out and making them at least admit why they voted for Trump... Um, and making them go deeper than because I wanted to, because I can vote for who I want. Like, yes, but what about his policies made you think, this is a good guy to lead the country? Oh, this is, this is what they say. You don't understand the economy. Oh, really? I pay way more taxes than Donald Trump does, and I assure you. I think I have more I'm money than he does. I'm crystal clear. I might have more money than I he does. I think you do. I, in fact, I know I think you we do. all do. I think we're all actually I know like, have way do. more money than he really does. You know, it's this idea that when people say that, it shows they don't really understand the economy. And there's something you said earlier. Like, people think that it was working class rural voters who put Trump in office. And certainly, there were some rural voters who did put Trump in office. But a lot of Trump voters were middle class, white, educated uh, people who and voted women. for him and women. And yeah. so we have to, first of all, stop pretending that this is a problem over there. Yeah. It's a problem right here in our communities, mm -hmm. um, wherever we are. And we have to start showing that w a woman can be president, that there are incredibly qualified women who are going to be running for the 2020 presidency. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I don't love them, they're better than Donald Trump. Of course. And I really need people to stop pretending like, oh, you know, they're so this, they're so that. Like, a shoebox is better than Donald Trump, yes. okay? Yeah. So get it together. Is that your candidate pick? Yes. Okay. I'm my, actually, I'm my in. candidate pick is Stacey Abrams. Oh, who love it. has not declared whether or not she's going to run. But she's also taken herself out of the senatorial Correct. race, so she's available. Yes, and um, I have a podcast and with Tressie McMillan Cottom, and we actually talked to Stacey Abrams two days ago and, mm -hmm. or no, was it yesterday? It was yesterday. It's been, it's a long week. <laughs> and she said that there's still time to declare in the fall mm -hmm. and have a good shot at it. So she doesn't want to declare, if she's going to declare, I get the impression that she's not going to go too early. Um, but of the people that are running, I'm really into Elizabeth Warren. It's so... What about you? You know, it's so funny. I, um, I was, you know, doing the, the deadly late night tweeting. Mm. And I actually, believe it or not, I'm actually uh, more concerned with the down ballot because when I, whenever I go and have the opportunity to speak or whatever, I um, am shocked at how many people think that elections are only every four years. They are every year. Not every two years, they're every year. In fact, there's a ballot initiative in Los Angeles now. I just got the ballot thing. I'm going to look it up and do your research. It's, it's really a 10-minute Google search. It's not as intimidating as people think. But um, I just, my dream ticket would be Elizabeth Warren mm -hmm. because I think she has proven that she has the fight to go against Trump and get under his skin. I think her uh, policies are very clearly laid out. Yes. And, uh, you know, Stacey Abrams as VP T you know, teeing her up to take over would be my dream. So if, if I could have a magic wand, I would do Elizabeth Warren for one term and Stacey for two. Oh. As if the plan is going to last that long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> gonna... I know, that optimism there, like 12 right? years? No. Woo! I don't know. No. I don't three know. Three months. Three months max. I give the plan a three months. Enjoy and that's yourselves. what's interesting, like, it used to be, especially when I was growing up, and I'm 44, when we talked about global warming, it was this thing that was centuries out. Mm -hmm. And we had to worry about our grandchildren's children. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, we're starting to realize that it, we're not centuries out. We're years out, and our lifetimes There's out. There's already water wars. Yes. I mean, people think the war in Syria is a water war. Uh, people uh, run out of water and food, and they move and they leave their countries and yep. and they have to go somewhere else to find it that's and right. eventually those places where they go are going to run out of water um south in south africa um i think it was cape town just dealt with a water crisis where they ran out of water mm -hmm. they literally had no water left mm -hmm. and we're going to start seeing that more and more and so i'm curious what issues are in addition to things like global warming are most important to you as we look ahead to 2020 well uh, 
any areas where we're really going backwards. So climate change, you know, I, I actually do, the thing I actually like about Jay Inslee is that he made it his main issue. The thing that I am confused about is why people keep saying climate change isn't a kitchen table topic. So what I asked the governor, I saw him last week, and I said, can you please figure out some kind of catchy, sexy phrase or mm -hmm. something? Because I understand, you know, uh, people have to pay rent and they have to take care of their kids and obviously health care. But climate change, you know, whether you call it, I know uh, Congressman Ted Lieu prefers uh, carbon pollution because he feels like, how can you argue against those words? Um, but that's a paradigm shift that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's leading that, but it is so visible to all of us everywhere, whether you travel the world or not. It's, it's everywhere and it's so imminent. And, you know, my joke is like when they made An Inconvenient Truth, like Al Gore kind of acted like we had like maybe 100 years. Then even he had to like cut it down to 50. And then I just cut it to three months. I said, <laughs> look, you know, so that is, that's one of those issues that for me is tied in with Trumpism. Mm -hmm. Because when you know, how, remember how long it took John Kerry to negotiate the Paris Accord. And even that was a compromise when we even achieved it. So the other issues are anything rolling back, obviously the, the equal rights yeah. across the board, racial, gender, uh, you know, human human beings, et cetera. Uh, the things that terrify me are um, probably, of all the stuff that the administration do has done, I guess the, uh, the uh, kids in cages, meaning the internment of asylum seekers, is probably the most egregious. Mm -hmm. But honestly, it's hard to pick. So it's imp it frustrates me when people don't want to even take the time to educate themselves, and I'm sorry, this is an LA thing. Like, I don't read the news, it's like negative. Okay, well, read it. Um, <laughs> and by the way, TMZ is not a newspaper, okay? Just wanna be clear about that. It's called the Los Angeles Times, and it's quite a good paper, and we should be very proud of it. Um, I feel like LA people, like, don't, like, they're embarrassed that we're not the New York Times. LA Times is a great paper. The LA Times is great. Yeah, it's actually. a great paper, so don't be it. And they have great book it. coverage, just FYI. All right, but there you go. They're doing great book coverage, they're doing great environment coverage, yeah. they're doing some really great coverage on the whole homeless problem in yeah. the city. Oh, that's uh, a whole other liberals yes. changing their mind, <sighs> right? Liberals are But so you guys terrible. know about this, right? So uh, I think it's like, uh, you know, I think Long Beach and I think Venice and there's some areas that are considered, well, I don't know about Long Beach, but considered to be liberal areas. And so they um, have designated some areas that can be homeless areas and basically kind of tent cities. And it's just, funny, all the liberal white people are like, oh, um, I said I was a liberal, but I didn't know there was going to be a homeless guy two blocks away. Mm -hmm. He's probably part of that caravan who's going to kill me. And so it seemed like they made a, a switch real freaking quick yes. when it was in their name. I think when it made them uncomfortable, when it got too close, where they had yeah. to look at it every single day, mm -hmm. um, they decided, oh, no, that's not what I meant. I meant mm -hmm. like over there in some other community, like right. Toluca Lake. Uh, <laughs> and... It's Big homeless just, hub. It's really something. I'm, I've been coming to L.A. for about five years now, and I bought a house recently, and so I live here now. And it's very interesting to see the ways in which Angelinos completely ignore the problems happening right here. Yeah. I lived downtown for two and a half years, and you can't miss it in right. downtown. Like we, we were maybe three blocks from uh, Skid Row, and in a, I mean, in a really nice building. And that's the thing. Like in LA, you can have this gorgeous building and then look to your left and there is a tent city. Mm -hmm. And people walk by the tent city every single day. And when I first moved here, I was just like, every time I got in an Uber, I said, I would say like a total hick because I'm from the country. I'm like, did you see that? And they're like, right. see what? Yeah. And I'm just like, the city of, of tents mm -hmm. and people living in families, they have pets. Mm -hmm. And like this is the best we can do in in one of the wealthiest parts of the country. And also, this is who you're threatened by. Oh, yeah, you're not worried about the white supremacist from uh, Beverly Glen and Sunset who had the who had the thousand pile guns. Of thousand guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am not afraid of people who are unhomed. I am afraid of people who keep people unhomed. Yeah. And. Um, and it's an effort, and yeah. they need to be shamed as well. They really do. Because and they kind of do it under the guise of, like, it's for the safety of the children. It's not. Like, no, you, you, your children that you won't vaccinate? Okay. Uh, 
Okay. There's so much, you know, like, it's exactly what you said. There's so much to choose from right now right. in terms of, like, what's the worst, whether right. it's what's happening in Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio. So I want to talk to you about that yeah. because you've written about being a rape survivor and yes. a, a gang rape survivor. Yes. So the psychology of that is... Um, I don't even want to say unimaginable because I can, I'm can. quite sure most of the people in this room, including myself, have experienced that or something similar. Uh, my eldest brother actually was a pedophile and became homeless. Mm -hmm. So there's many levels and colors to the, both of those situations. And I wrote about that in my first book and all this other stuff. But um, that is another thing that is, you know, we kind of joke about, like, we're really turning into the handmaid's tale. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But the, the fact that that is actually being adjudicated mm -hmm. and um, we are seeing on tape, and this is why I said I'm really into the down ballot, because please get to know your state legislators. And what I say, I perform for a lot of gay audiences, and I say, remember you guys, remember Kim Davis, that bitch that wouldn't marry the two guys? She was an elected county supervisor. Like, honestly, just take two minutes and before you just go like, oh, I'm just going to worry about the presidential. Learn The county supervisor might affect your personal life more than a presidential decision. Mm -hmm. So down ballot, down ballot, down ballot. Um, but that the it, it's beyond to me the trying to tear apart Roe v. Wade. So yeah. what is what do you think that's about? Because it's a level of anger and fear. And when I saw the statistic that point five of one percent, half of a percent of rape cases get convictions. And so the new law is if you accuse a man of rape but he gets acquitted, you go to jail even though the statistic is less than 1% get convic convictions. And we've all read the stories about the police you know, uh, departments that lose thousands of rape kits, et cetera. So how bad is it going to get? Mm -hmm. And do you think there's one group of people sort of driving this? Because they are not playing around. No, they're not. What we're really seeing is a reaction, I think, to Me Too and more w women coming forward. And finally, a handful of men facing consequences. And so I think legislators across the country are trying to put women back in their places. And they're trying to ensure that they can continue to behave as ev however they want. How do they compartmentalize and not just imagine what if this was my mom, my daughter, my cousin, because my they sister? Can. They can. Because they don't have to. Uh, that's what white masculinity has afforded them. And it's not only white men, to be clear. Half of the people who drafted the current bill in Georgia were women. And white women. Of course. And do you think it's tied into the evangelical thing? I don't know. Because can we be because real about that? They like, don't I just really care be... about Christ. I'm sorry, but uh, if you're an no, evangelical and you're going to vote for Donald Trump, your faith is bullshit. And, and I, 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 I'm, I said it. I'm, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm what you call a fallen Catholic, but Same. even what I remember from catechism, like they never, the, none of the stuff that they say was in the Bible yeah. was in the Bible. And, no, and people continually don't call them out on that. Or if they do... I, I don't even know what their answer is. Yeah, people are always so afraid of calling it out. And I, I come from a, a conservative Catholic family. My family still practices. So I have no problem with faith. And I think 90% of the world, if not more, believes in God and follows a religion of some kind. And yet here are these people who claim to be followers of Christ and ignore all of Christ's teachings. Mm -hmm. I know the Bible better than you do. And it's really infuriating that they're using women to advance their causes. And what mm -hmm. they're really trying to do is hold on to as much power as possible. And they recognize that women are more than half of the world's population. And so if mm -hmm. we control women, we control everything. Yeah. That's what their thinking is. But women have gotten the health care that they need, regardless of law, forever. Mm -hmm. And so you can make it more difficult for women to have access to reproductive choices, but women are still going to be making those reproductive choices. And so when you enact legislation like this, what you're telling us is that you don't matter, women. It's also, t the message is loud and clear. I don't care how severe the assault was, yep. don't even bother. Don't Correct. even bother reporting This idea it. that you're supposed to carry a child to term after being raped, like to have your body violated again, is so appalling and that to me is the thing that tells on these men and mm -hmm. lets us know exactly what kind of trash they are because they don't care about women and they don't care about children because they don't 
uh, support social programs. They don't support a social safety net to support these women and these children after the child is born. They just want to make sure that women will continue being vessels. And I, I find it alarming. But I find it alarming. Why do you think men are right now, and I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of Trump on the way down, but all the way down, but what are they so afraid of? Meaning, I really do believe that equality, I mean, well, it's proven, equality helps elevate any and every society. Yeah. I actually like that dude from Davos who said rich people should pay 70% tax yeah. and that's what nobody wants to say. And if that was my tax bracket, and it, and it may be, I'm, ha I'm happy to do it too because I understand it benefits everyone to give them a chance at equality. Mm -hmm. But that seems like a such a simple message I've been hearing for decades. And who's stopping that simple message from getting through? Equality benefits Everyone, financial equality, the way we treat each other, listening to each other, informing each other, uh, and yet the sort of conspiracy right has, they're, they're, they've so outshouted us. Yeah. And I'm wondering why you think, wh what do you think these guys' worst fears are? That women are gonna that like show gonna up with torches power. like Charlottesville or what? Because they see equality But they already have so much. There's yeah. enough power to go around. But that's how it works. Like power, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so these people don't want to share the power. They see equality as oppression. And so they're terrified of that. They're terrified of having to give up some of their power because they know how good it is. And I think the same thing goes with wealth. When you have someone who is worth more than $100 billion and pays no taxes at all, mm -hmm. like let's get them to a 10% tax rate before we even dream of 70%. Yeah. But I, I, I also think it should be 70%. And I'm entering that tax bracket where I would be taxed at taxed at 70%. And well, you know what? Sorry. It's fine. I like the fire I'll department. Fine. I like the post office. Remember we used to make fun of the post office? You know well, what else I like? Clean water. Uh, okay, so that's my next question. Air. How is it that the Mercers or the Koch brothers, how is it that they really convince themselves that Flint can't happen in their town because they're wealthy? Because they can move. They don't but care if water it doesn't work that town. way. Dirty water yeah. goes anywhere, anytime, anywhere. I mean, there was a there was a LA report two days ago saying you can get cancer from drinking LA tap water, yeah. and I think rich people have genuinely convinced themselves that when the crisis comes to them, they can buy their way out of it. And we are starting when it when it comes to water, we are eventually going to get to a crisis point where no one can buy their way out. Of course. But rich people love to delude themselves. Same with themselves. air. Same with air. Correct. And that's what's really alarming. Like that the truly wealthy don't recognize how bad things are going to get, not only for those of us who are among the proletariat, for but for, as for them well. too. It's kind of like what I was saying about, it's, it's really so easy to support women, and yeah. I wish women wouldn't be so reticent to do it, but honestly, the, as much as I don't like the Cokes and the Mer Mercers, when you, or the Waltons, you know, when you have that amount of wealth, it would be so easy to do something about you know, we say climate change should be nonpartisan, but they really must think it's partisan. They really must think that they breathe separate air. I think that they do think that. I genuinely do. And I, I read a lot of- how are you not a complete shit. moron? Like, how can you think that? Well, because you can't buy intelligence. <laughs> like, there's lots and lots of things you can buy. You can buy smart people to work for you, but you if you're not gonna listen to them, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that a lot of truly wealthy people <laughs> surround themselves with people who allow them to believe their delusions, who allow them to believe that they are masters of the universe. Oh, don't get me started on the Jack Dorseys and the Mark oh, Zuckerbergs. come on. I mean, these people who starve themselves are, are like, you know, Jack Dorsey who's like, I'm not going to eat meat. But then you fly in a private jet. Like, you're not saving he's, the environment by not eating meat when you fly in a private plane. Yeah, he's horrible. Just, he's horrible. Like, I really have questions, like, serious questions about him because I remember thinking he was cool because he covered Ferguson. And I remember thinking, oh, like, the head of Twitter went to Ferguson and is mm. filming it. And now I honestly think he has white supremacist leanings. And I can only assume money corrupts. But I blame the social media owners, in, including YouTube and all of them, for, you know, I just, I don't understand how people cannot understand the simple fact that they are manipulating elections globally mm -hmm. just as much as the Russian interference, uh, now Ukrainian. I'm sure you've heard Rudy Giuliani with this new Grecian formula yeah. um, haircut. Um, and I don't, why do you think like simple things like that um, our, I'm gonna say our team, meaning liberals or whatever you wanna call us, progressives. Why do you think we have such a problem messaging something so simple as, okay, social media, you know, it, it, it it's, has its benefits, but 
there's a handful of incredibly wealthy people, like you said, that seem to have been incredibly corrupted yeah. over the years and with impunity and are changing elections globally that will affect each and every one of us. Yeah, I think we just get in our own way. And I think on the left, we are so caught up in being morally pristine and right that we don't say the obvious things. And it, they should be regulated. It, they They're should be regulated. Like, they, how do you not, they, after like what happened in 2016, newspapers, just how are we not regulating media? Facebook? I think because a lot of the old farts, like those senators, you know, like, I don't know if you saw which one interviewed Zuckerberg and thought he was from Google or something like that. <laughs> like, you know, I think that's that's part of it. Yes. But even well, if you don't have a, uh, you know, a, a lesson from AOC about Twitch, um, it's amazing <laughs> that they, they, I can't believe that they don't know what's happening globally. I can't, I'm I not going to give them a pass. I think they know and I don't think they care. I genuinely think that they know, they know and they're like, it's not my problem. I'll be dead before it's my problem. Oh. I think they don't care. And that means they don't care about their children or their grandchildren, which tells you who they are. Yeah. Like when people show you who they are, we have to start believing them. Yeah. And stop expecting some of these people on the right to be reachable. Like one of the key things we keep talking about is how do we reach Trump voters? And the answer is we don't. Never. We reach people who were apathetic who did not vote in 2016, who decided that no vote was better than voting for Hillary Clinton. We reach people which that I have can't never even voted say with a straight because face. they've never had Correct. a need to feel engaged. So like, what we need to be working on right now is uh, addressing voter suppression, which is happening yeah. in almost every single state. Mm -hmm. And we need to be getting out the vote and reaching people. We need to be talking about what's happening in Florida with what they have essentially instituted is a poll tax. Um, what does that explain that to me? So, you have to pay a fee, basically, if you are a former felon to vote. And poll taxes were outlawed by the Constitution and because it's a way of keeping working class people out of the polls. Yeah. And Florida has basically instituted a poll tax, and they call it something else. They call it a fine or a fee. So first they said, okay, ex-felons can vote. Yes, and then they were like, hold the on, poll voted, tax. But now they've created this tax. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. These mm -hmm. people are using democracy, which is designed to serve the people against the people. Mm -hmm. And it's truly appalling. And those are the things that we need to be worrying about instead of glowing profiles about white supremacists and rural voters. Mm -hmm. And I'm from Nebraska, so I don't think we need to ignore people in rural places in any way, shape, or form. What I'm saying is that they are not the only voters in this country that matter. And until you care about working class black voters and Latino voters as Who change the midterms. Others. Like, yes. hello, do then we not learn anything not really from the midterms? Caring. People of color, women of color in particular, who got us 41 seats in the House. Yes. And if we can just flip seven fucking seats in the Senate, I, I'm just amazed. And I, I think can't it's believe, doable. I, I, we got to get Orrin Hatch out. All those yes. freaking guys that run for Anita Hill, or Orrin Hatch, Chuck Grassley. I know you have your issues with Biden. I do. You know, look, I, if, Biden, if Biden gets the nomination, he gets my vote and he gets my money. Like, that's it. I'm, we have no choice. But until then, uh, you know, yeah. the great thing about the primaries is that we can vote our conscience in the primaries. Yeah. <laughs> please do. Please do. Don't vote who you think's going to win. Really vote for the person that you want. Yes, that you're passionate about. And maybe about. she will. Yes. <laughs> then she, she will. She has to be. She will win. Well, yeah, so we're, now we're going to take some questions from the audience. And so if you have a question, raise your hand, and this lovely woman in white will bring you a microphone. Start with a woman. <laughs> So thank you so much for that conversation. It was really um, insightful. You, you both talked a lot about the politics of shame, that shame has become a really effective weapon in this particular age. But I'm also concerned about people who seem to be above and beyond shame. They seem absolutely shameless. Mm -hmm. And I'm also concerned about the ways in which, as a black woman, I've been encouraged to be ashamed of myself, of my body, queer community. Shame has been used in such a powerful way against us for so long that it's a strange political moment that now we are mobilizing shame ourselves. And so I wonder if you could talk about the complicated relationship to shame, particularly with regard to the internet and social media, because it's a place where that shame can be so palpable um, and you suffer it alone in your private space, but yeah. it's, it's also out there in the world. Well, let me clarify. I, I really, I, I, there should be a new word for it, because what I'm talking about is, if anybody saw the Mark Harris hearing, where his own son, I believe, was like a local AG and had to testify against him. Mm -hmm. Mark Harris was a congressman from, somebody help me. 
a southern state. And, uh, and he was busted using a dude who was known for decades in that state for literally taking Democratic votes and just throwing them away. So he said it didn't happen. Uh, he, contested, you know, he contested his victory. And they had a hearing about it. And his own son, being an attorney, said, you know, I love my parents. But yeah, I, I told my dad, this, you know, this guy does this. And Mark Harris then burst into tears. Uh, testified, by the way, he, he uh, threw his own son under the bus, and when they asked him, he was like, you know, he means well, but <laughs> he's really not so smart. Then when the son, you know, was really specific, they literally went into like a secret room, and Mark Harris came out, and they're going to have a whole new election now. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, I don't mean the word shame in the way you're talking about, because what you're talking about is very real. I think it's a way of shaming through facts, like when you can bust someone like Mark Harris on camera when even his own son is saying, sorry, Dad, I'm not going to lie under oath for you. That actually made Mark Harris go, OK, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, uh, not run anymore. So maybe we'll come up with a new phrase, because I totally agree with you and hear what you're saying. Yeah. I think that's a great question, and it's something that I'm struggling with, because as a fat, black, queer woman, shame is used against me every single day, not only on social media, but in the real world. And so how can I then suggest that we take that and use it as a tool to achieve a given uh, end? And you know, I think the answer is very carefully. And it's unfortunate, and that's what's so terrible about this political moment right now, is that it's forcing us to do the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And it's forcing us to work against our own principles in order to achieve something like normalcy, because we're so far from normal. The other challenge is that some of these people are fucking shameless, and so we can shame them all they want. Like, the president is shameless. Mm -hmm. I read a story the other day about him cheating on a golf game. With a kid. Yes. With a little boy. And... It's just like he's beyond yeah. shame. He's beyond reality. I, I do believe he's got several things going on in addition to hubris. But that's also a true story that's yeah. on the record. So I think what you're referring to is shaming based on things that are not true. For if you're shamed because of the color of your skin, that's not a legit reason to shame someone. But if there's actual, like, you know, some the father, I believe, and son both went on record yeah. and said the president took my, my son's golf ball and said it was his, that is a different way. It, I guess I'm talking about shaming when you can prove that it's a fact and not the you know call, name calling ba that's baseless. Yeah. Like I would consider like the Mark Harris thing and the Trump golf, like that's not baseless. It's actual, Correct. It, you can see it right the there. The reality is that a lot of the ways in which these men in power are behaving are true. And so we have to use the truth against them. We have to talk about the truth over and over again. And the truth is shameful. And in that instance, I, I just, I think we have to use it in the most powerful ways that we can. And I think we have to also steal a dirty trick from the other team, which is just do it over and over and over. It's like that repetitive messaging, which is totally the opposite of like online bullying and name calling. Like that's just, that's, you know, I, I, I should have, I, like I said, I wish there was a different term because that's shaming just to be a bully and then there's pointing something out yep. which may shame someone because they did something really fucked up <laughs> and there's we proof really of have it. to reclaim the truth because so much of what has happened especially since 2016 is this manipulation of reality where you do something or say something that they don't like and they say that you're fake news mm -hmm. and that everything you're doing is a lie and I believe that we have to elevate the truth above all, all things. And it, it, we just have to do this. And we have to point out reality to them because they keep trying to reshape reality. They keep trying to make us think that we are crazy and that we're wrong and that we're imagining these things that are happening in real time every single day. Mm -hmm. And you look at these policies that the president and his administration are pushing through that are affecting the transgender community, that are affecting people of color, that are affecting poor people, that are affecting people in probably every walk of life. And we may not be feeling it in our very comfortable day-to-day -day lives, but we will be feeling mm -hmm. it very soon. And so we have to do whatever it takes to get these people out of power. And I am not certain that that's going to happen in 2020. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a struggle. It's a, very, it's a struggle, and that's a great question. Uh, next. Hi. Hi. 
Um, so similar topic about shame. Um, I found in my own personal experience of when I meet someone and we are in disagreement and I can shame them, more often than not, I am then met with some degree of violence, whether that be physical or verbal. And I'm wondering, do you find it as sort of, sort of the tactic to take is sort of civil disobedience, sort of like take it on, or do we then engage in that violence and that sensibility with them? Because then are you not just sort of on the same mindset as them if you're reaching them with violence as well? So I'm wondering what your guys' thoughts are on that. I don't think violence is ever the solution, ever. I think that resorting to violence means that you know you have no leg to stand on. You have no foundation to argue from. I think that we have to prioritize safety. I don't think violence is ever the answer. And I don't think we're there. And I, by the way, when I say you know pointing out things, I would never, um, I know a lot of people thought I did this a couple years ago, incite violence, <laughs> but boy, people believed it. Um, but like, for example, uh, if you see, you know, the Clive and Bundys or the militias, the rednecks at the border that are just shooting brown people with impunity, that is something that, whether you call it shaming or not, I would call it just pointing it out. But I agree. I don't think the answer is to then get a bunch of liberals with gun to go and then shoot mm -hmm. it out. But that's how I feel like the other team, that's how they, how they act. Like, you guys know there's like seven people in Antifa. Like, this whole Antifa thing is really a made-up, like, bullshit, you know. And then, you know, there was a, a, an issue at Berkeley, and they found out, a, like, it was a bunch of conservative dudes who were dressing as Antifa so they could show it on Fox News, and then... The president loves to bring up Antifa. And like I said, I think the membership is about seven people, not a big caravan. Um, but the violence, I often feel, in my, in my experience, it's the other team. And like you said, when they don't have a leg to stand on, but especially when you have pointed something out. Like if you show the photos of those militia dudes, I don't know if you saw the footage of the, I don't know if it was the sheriff's department, where they had to physically move them because they, were, they didn't know they were on private property. And, you know, it's right there. So uh, that's what I'm saying is if we can just keep showing maybe that footage online or I wish the media would cover it more over and over and over, then it's very clear that our side isn't saying, you know, we want to we want to start shooting back. It's just our side saying, hey, just don't look away. This is really happening. And by the way, if you know one of these freaks who's like taking up a gun and acting like he's a ICE officer and isn't and just going on private property and, like I said, shooting brown people with impunity, why don't you call them out? Why don't you go to the local police department if you even feel safe doing that? I still don't know why. I don't know what's going on with the Charlottesville PD to this day. I mean, those guys are all, you know, everybody knows their name and likeness. And I believe they're, you know, we're like something like two arrests. But when I heard that they arrested the black guy who, the famous photo where he's using, um, I don't even know what it's called, it's a can that has fire, because there was a Nazi trying to literally spear him with a flag, that guy got arrested. So when I say, like, kind of pointing stuff out, I wish our team would be a little bit better at showing those images, which are real, over and over and over, and, you know, backing it up with real news sources, not... Facebook memes and stuff like that. <laughs> but you're right. When you even point something out, I mean, I certainly know that world. If I even post that clip, it's, I'm going to shoot you on stage, you cunt. And it's endless, endless, endless. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's where we are. And that's sort of why I tie the whole thing into the social media folks. And I, I really believe Kara Swisher when she says they do have the capability to fix it. They're just so greedy. They just want the money. They'll just, they'll just take it. And not even thinking, if you're Jack Dorsey or Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg, you're not worried that your own kids are dealing with this stuff? Yeah. I, I, I don't get it. They, but, they can fix it. And, and, you know, the thing is, I get death threats with alarming frequency. And more and more I have security at all of my events. And so that's why, for me, violence is not an answer. Um, like, how, like, that you think because I say women are people that you need to respond violently or that as a queer woman, I have every right to live with my partner and love and marry my partner and have a child, and you think that I deserve to die because of that? Violence will never be the answer for me. Mm -hmm. I think we should do actually more amplification of that, which is honestly, it really is the conservatives who 
in my experience, come they come at me for sure with yep. violence for either you know anything from a joke in my act to your sexuality or your just your living situation. Yeah. So I, I think it's the more we can do of saying like, yeah, that's really their team's playbook. It's just it's not ours. And it's important to call it out. I call it out as often as humanly possible because I don't think people realize when you're outspoken as we are, how I don't know how real the danger is, but it feels real. Every time I go on stage, I wonder, is this the day I'm going to get shot? Yeah, me too. And I hope it's not on screen because I don't want my loved ones to see right. it. Right. And I'm just a fucking writer. Like, really? I mean, I get it. I say a lot of shit. But, but I, I say, <laughs> but I, like, I say rational things. But this really wasn't around five years ago. Like, no, I'm it really saying, wasn't. As someone it's who's gotten been touring wildly for decades. Worse. Like, my joke is like, oh, I wish the old days where you could make a joke about some jizz on a dress, you know, and you really could say anything about, about world leaders and the president, obviously, and people didn't even really have an issue with it. If the joke was funny, it was funny. But yeah, I... I, I uh, think it's the past four years. Yes. Five years. And by I think the way, a, I think it's since, since, like, just prior to the, uh, the escalator. Yeah. It, so when people even say, like, since the inauguration, I'm like, no, no, there was a, quite a bit before that. Mm -hmm. And I think, once again, we need to keep messaging. Like, I know when I toured overseas, everywhere I went, every single country, if I was getting, you know, lunch at a cafe or whatever, they would just hear my American accent and just stop whatever they were doing and go, what the hell's going on over there? You guys used to be the bastion of liberal, you know, example. And, I, and then you get into the electoral college and gerrymandering, and they're like, just fix it, you know? <laughs> so that's another thing is, unfortunately, I personally didn't realize uh, until recently, maybe the last couple of years, that this has been a movement since the Civil Rights Act, mm -hmm. a slow and, I hate to say it, smart and strategic movement from the far right to the, frankly, to the moderate, you know, Republicans who are Caucasian. Absolutely. To, uh, they, they lost their fucking shit at the Civil Rights Act. They really did. And yeah. we've even seen in the past 10 years a lot of outreach from alt-right and white supremacist organizations to gamers and disaffected young yeah. men who lure them in under the guise of gaming and also the other thing, incels. And then they convert them into white supremacy. And people always love to talk about radicalization when it comes to things like Islam, but there is a lot of radicalization that is happening with good white boys from nice families. Right it's now. rampant in America, it, I would it's suggest. It's terrifying. And it's also, uh, the Daily Beast wrote an article about someone being radicalized who was a completely different person in a matter of three weeks, mm -hmm. just from online stuff, yep. three weeks. And they really, it, that's very frightening to me because I'm from, yes. you know, I'm from a world before the interweb. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, that's one of those things that I, I struggle with. Because it, it seems pretty easy to figure out what's real news and what isn't, and it seems... Like, the publications you know are legit. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but Newsweek was purchased by, like, a bunch of crazy people, so you can't really trust them anymore, but time is still okay. Like, I think it's good that we keep up on stuff like that and, like I said, amplify things like that. Just be careful. Newsweek, every so often, will slide in a legit article, but they're not the Newsweek that I grew up with. Yeah. So, <laughs> spread the word. Let's take another question. <laughs> You both kind of talked about the fact that, like, sometimes it feels like you could just, like, pick an issue. Like, everything feels overwhelming on a yep. daily basis. And so, um, you know, for myself personally, like, I want to be cognizant of, like, using my privilege um, for positive, you know, like, in a, in a good way and be a good ally. But sometimes it does feel like, what the fuck should I actually do? So I'm curious, like, from your perspective, like, there are elections coming up. Like, what are the, like, two or three things that you think are, like, really important for us to act, that are actions that aren't just, like, being angry or being mm -hmm. frustrated or, like, like just wanting to cry at the end of every day, like what are real things that we should be doing, whether it's phone banking or visiting or like going to the border and like working with the people that are there, mm -hmm. like taking donations, like truly like that will be impactful yep. to hopefully turning things around in the future, whether it's like from an election standpoint or just yep. like from a humanity perspective. I think the first thing is money. Supporting grassroots local organizations with money. Um, we live in a capitalist society, and money goes a long way. It can also be vetted really pretty easily. Yes. And, like, I don't know if like, Fox News spends a lot of time trashing charities and saying how <clears throat> they don't get audited enough, et cetera. So it's interesting when you hear from, if Fox News doesn't want you to donate to any charity, 
that's a little bit of a red flag. Correct. And then volunteering. And, you know, you, volunteering, one of the key things that people can volunteer for upcoming is the census. Because if we're not counted, we will not ever have our needs met by the government. And the Trump administration is trying to modify who gets counted and why. Women and people of color and immigrant communities are the least counted v via the census. And so census efforts are really a demonstrable way in which you can create change. It's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but it's the actual work that needs to be done. And I think a lot of times when people are looking for something to do, they're looking for something sexy. But the reality is to create change, sometimes you have to do the really unsexy grind, which means going from door to door with your little census notebook and making sure that people are counted. So volunteering for organizations connected to the census or doing work as a census worker. Um, and I, I think that voting in your local elections on the offbeat, like we have an election coming up. I too just got my fake mm -hmm. ballot in the mail and um, on the internet because I wanted to be able to read it from wherever I was. And read it, research the local issues, research the local candidates. And again, it's not sexy, but it doesn't need to be because these local elections are affecting so much and it trickles upward in this instance. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe if, if there's um, two or three uh, of these issues that touch you personally. So, you know, for me, I'm obviously very immersed in the LGBT community because I have a history of, you know, advocating for gay folks and going to the Hill, et cetera. So it's something I have a lot of sort of experience in. So I go, okay, I sort of have a, a leg to stand on. So everybody here probably has three areas where they just happen to have a legit tentacle or a legit um, connection to. So probably also the more passionately you feel, and I, like we said, it's a deluge of issues, but maybe the three that like get to you the most for whatever reason. And everyone here is, will probably be different. Mm -hmm. Next question. Sister up there. OK, there we go. Hi, uh, I, my name is Nia. Hi. Um, I'm enjoying learning so much from you guys today. Um, but one thing that like I've been thinking this whole time is um, you guys are both super important. You have great things to say. Um, you're very intelligent, very well spoken. Um, I just want to know like, what, mo what keeps you grounded and motivated to keep doing the unsexy work, um, although you might have cameras in your face and people asking you to do things for them and favors and all of that. So what keeps you grounded in doing the things that really matter? Because it's so easy to get distracted, especially with like, technology, social media, paparazzi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think what keeps me grounded is that I'm always going to be a black woman first. And no matter what I achieve, the world is always going to remind me of that. And if I know that, then what about women who don't have the same level of cultural visibility or economic access to what I have access to? Like, what are they dealing with? And so that's what motivates me. And also, I think, like most people, I just want to feel like I leave this world slightly better than I found it. I, and I don't mean it in a cheesy way, but I truly do feel like I have been given so many blessings in life. I, you know, my parents are still married. My brothers are okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, have, I come from a strong family. I'm well loved. I have good friends. I have my health. Um, I've dealt with some shitty things in life, but for the most part, I've been blessed. And like the least I can fucking do is try and do some good in this world. It's genuinely the least I could do. And so that's what motivates me. Yeah, I feel like I just can't. Right. <laughs> applause break, applause break. <laughs> Every comedian's dream, applause break. Uh, I also feel like I just can't look away. So like I said, I really have kind of zero tolerance for folks, and I've kind of weeded them out of my life, to be honest, that just you know don't want to look at you know a newspaper and don't want to talk about it. I'm like, it's all happening around you. So. I think the more we talk about it, the better. And I hear what you're saying about the social media distractions and stuff. So, uh, you know, being a 58 year old woman as a stand up comic, I every day am faced with, you know, the audacity. Who do you think you are to be an old, ugly hag and still in the game? And in the meantime, you know, all, the, all my male counterparts are, you know, whipping their dicks out, rubbing them against everybody. And I never whipped out my vulva once. Not one time. <laughs> Not one time. And honestly, like, it's so, it's so black and white to me that 
in my pro particular profession, it's really night and day to be a female comic and be a male comic. It's almost like two different professions. So like you said, as I get older, it gets more intense mm -hmm. with, Ugh, isn't she ever going to go away? And that gives me sort of more of the fight. So whatever you guys are dealing with, I know everybody has something where some, whether it's social media or real person, sort of saying, stop, go away, you're too loud, you're too this, you shouldn't have this opinion. Let that be a red flag. And, and maybe they're right, but probably your instincts are correct. And like I said, it's so easy to do stuff, and that's the part that I struggle with. It doesn't always have to be the most heroic thing, and you know, but there's a lot of things that are accessible and doable, and things where also, by the way, you'll meet real live people, and it will help you get offline. Like, I don't know about you, but I have two lives. I have an online life that is just death, and you're an ugly cunt who has to die and go back to ISIS and go back to Raqqa, and you tried to kill a president. And then I have my real life where people are, they say hi to me, and they're nice, and I try to make them laugh, and they come to my <laughs> shows. And, you know, uh, I think it's, I'm sure a lot of you feel that way, you know, that when you go online, it's hard. You look at that stuff, and, you know, you know, I don't know who's a robot anymore, and they've mm. now done everything from stealing stock footage to manipulating parts of faces and all that stuff. So that shit's real. And I don't know. I'm a big believer, too. And I like sort of the putting your phone down moments or whatever, put it down for an hour a day or stuff like that, just to get you back to what human, the best of human beings. Because there is something about the online world that it's turned into, I believe, bringing out the worst in us. It's no longer the information highway. No, you know, and it's, I've been really alarmed, especially I've noticed it particularly in the past three months. Things are happening online, like, and what's great is perspective, and I do have a whole full life outside of the internet. Why do you think it's ramping up so much in the last three months? Uh, I think because we're starting to see more activity toward the next presidential election. I think it's connected to that, and I think it's just seeping into every aspect of social media and it's truly becoming alarming like there's no leeway for anyone to be human like no matter what there's someone jumping on you and saying oh you did that wrong or oh you're being this you're being that mm -hmm. um when you were just like man i was just tweeting about the yogurt i ate for breakfast <laughs> like wow yeah and i i think that even those of us with good intentions are becoming more and more intractable online and i think it's because we're feeling powerless and so we go to this space where we can have some kind of power uh, and I don't know how to fix it. I do know that a lot of it disappears when you put the internet away and I'm someone who was an early adopter. I've been on the internet for 30 years and I love it but my goodness like when we can't even breathe or be human and we have no tolerance for others to breathe and be human and I include myself in that it becomes really a question of what are we doing and how do we do better? Because like we can sit in this room and have a great conversation and everyone is getting along even if we don't agree with everyone. And that just shows like there's a level of civility that is being degraded. And I think, I think um, I'm sure that everyone in this room understands uh, when you're online and half the time you feel like you should take on a troll and fight back to show you're strong. And then half the time you say, don't give them that energy. And I don't know the formula yet. Yeah, I don't either. I, and I hate when people tell me, don't, don't, don't feed the troll. Right. I'm like, the trolls come for me 24 seven. Yeah. So whether I feed them or not, they're there. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to see is what I'm dealing with. Right. How intense it is, yeah. how serious it is, yeah. Like, I had the FBI come to my house and do a no-knock. Not because I, <laughs> Paul Matterford or Michael Cohen, I have nothing I'm hiding. But they did a no-knock because um, I didn't even know that uh, Cesar Sayek, the mag MAGA bomber, tweeted me three times saying he was going to kill me because I can't keep up with all of it. I mean, I'm on three platforms, but um, the FBI came over to say that he had shared his kill list with another group of like-minded people. Well, I had a performance that night. And I said, hmm, you're here on a night I have a performance. So did someone say they're going to shoot me on stage again? And they said, we can't you know, talk about that. It's an ongoing investigation. But that's another thing that I, I do feel like that's 
quote their team, and I agree, it's, it's a little tied in with the gaming world, but I'll be honest, I don't even, I've never been on Reddit. Like, I didn't know, I don't, didn't even know what Gab was. I'd never heard of it. I don't know 4chan and 16chan, and I don't know what the point of those is. It seems like, I, I, from what I understand, they're places where people want to go be part of a cesspool. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dang, Twitter and IG and Facebook are rough enough. I know, I can't imagine, I don't go on Reddit myself, or, because... Uh, once in a while, a Google alert will take me there, mm. and I, I've seen enough. Like, I'm good. <laughs> you got the message. I did. I'm like, okay, okay. okay you want to shoot me in the con? Got it. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. <laughs> so um, I thank both of you guys for being here to address a lot of issues that we have in this world. Um, my personal opinion, and then I have a question, is people being complacent and not treating people the way they want to be treated really is a standpoint of what we are and how we can do better as people. You know? And also my other question is, as far as the voting situation and the voter suppression, maybe some kind of way on your social media, um, you could connect them with the right people that are doing certain things as far as civil right lawyers that are on social media, they're really hitting people really hard and really going to like Oklahoma where the indigenous people didn't have uh, accessibility to even On their travel. own reservation. Right. Yeah. There were people that actually stepped up and found a way to, for them to have uh, transportation mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I think that also is also a part, to, a way to use social media in order for people with your great platform to kind of hit this voting suppression situation right on the head. I agree, and by the way, I'm, I'm open to anyone sending me actual information, which I will then vet to the best of my ability, but you're right, that's what social media should be used for in this time of crisis, and that's what it is. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. Man, let me tell you, can I, I just wanna close on one thing, and I know I'm gonna sound old-timey. I grew up in a generation where working for the government was an admirable thing. I mean, I, rem I can still hear my mom going, God damn it, the benefits are fantastic, Kathleen Mary. What do you want to be a goddamn <laughs> joke teller for, for Christ's sake? <laughs> and it makes me sad. And, you know, I went through a, a, a experience with several departments of the government, but um, I, I really wish we could get back to my, my teacher. My sister was a public school teacher. You were a teacher. And it makes me sad that um, I hear online so many young people, you know, I, I know it's a, a cliche, they want to be influencers or whatever, but I, I would love to know a way to get back to the simple reality that being a teacher is a great job. Being, you know, maybe it's a great job working for the government. Go ahead and take it for the benefits. I mean, I, I've, done, I've gone to Iraq and Afghanistan. I've met so many mem men and women in the service who sign up just for the benefits. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's really wanting benefits because you're in a very dangerous situation. So I, I wish that there could be a paradigm shift. I, I personally have always thought if we, could play, if we could get police officers and pay them 75 grand a year, you're going to get a better class of police officer. I'm sorry, but that's a, a government situation, whether it's state by state. So the more, I, in my opinion, we can amplify stuff like that, it makes me sad that working for the government has become like a, like a, I almost want to say like an embarrassment or something. And I think all those jobs are admirable and can pay well. And, you know, they, they, we have to remember that stuff. We do, we do, and I think a lot of people take for granted benefits because they have them and don't Ooh. recognize that not all of us do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all We're for going coming to out. Thank you. Have oh, we have oh. one more. All right. Not a question. I just wanted to say for, uh, I'm an editor at Playboy. Thank you for coming here and doing this in our space. Um, everything that you talked about and the risk for you to go out and bring awareness to these issues, um, I'm not gonna stump for the brand, but it's important to us, it is important to me, it is important to the people in the room. So when you give us an hour of your time and you allow us to have this conversation, it is an incredible honor and thank you so much for coming out here and giving us your time and doing this in the space. Thank you guys. Good crowd, what a crowd.